uh, Carol Tiberius is here, the slides are here, and so now we'll listen to the lexicographic process revisited. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you all for coming to this presentation. Um, I hope you're not going to expect too many solutions, <laughs> because then I'm going to disappoint you straight away. Um, but in this presentation, I'm going to report on a study that I'm currently doing together with Aneta Kloser from the Leibniz Institute for the German Language. Unfortunately, Aneta is not here today, otherwise she could have also tried to answer some of your questions. But about, um, yeah, our adventure in this started about eight years ago when we published a chapter together on the lexicographic process. And although uh, the lexicographic process does not seem to be a particular topical issue, or that's what we thought, <laughs> but I think uh, I was wrong in assuming that, seeing that there's so many people here today. But anyway, we feel that recent changes in lexicography and in related fields warrant uh, revisiting the lexicographic process. So why do we think that? Well, a number of reasons. First of all, knowing about uh, the lexicographic process facilitates the planning of new resources. Second, it also helps to understand in which parts of the process new technologies can be used. Thirdly, it supports the evaluation of form and content of existing dictionaries because you've got a common ground to compare things to. And finally, I think which is also important, it supports the user's understanding of the lexicographic process and hence it helps to appreciate users the resource that they are using. Or well, that's at least the idea. The outline of the presentation as follows. First, I'll dive into the definition of the lexicographic process. That's quite a historical uh, trace back actually. Then uh, discuss briefly the different phases that are distinguished in a lexicographic process. Then we come to the reasons for a new lexicographic process or processes. And finally, I hope there will be plenty of time for discussion so that we can learn more as well from you. So first, the definition. Uh, Wiegand was actually the first to consider and define the lexicographic process in full theoretical terms. And he defines it as the set of process activities carried out to create a particular dictionary. And I think that's important, a particular dictionary. Wiegand still made a distinction between processes with and without a computer. And I've only listed here his distinction for the processes with the computer. And in these, he distinguishes between a computer-assisted lexicographic process and a computer lexicographic process. And this is important for him. The computer-assisted lexicographic process always results in a printed dictionary. And I'm just setting the scene, so please don't get bored. But to have the full theoretical picture, this is important. And then uh, for the electronic process, the computer lexicographic process always results in an electronic dictionary. And this electronic dictionary can be time of writing, a CD-ROM, something on your PC, online dictionary, but also a resource for language technology use. But important to note, for Wiegand, the output, a, lang a resource for language technology, is not part of the lexicographic process. That was supposed to be studied in a different field. Then Caroline Müller-Spitzer builds on on the work of Wiegand and extends it basically to include the media neutral lexicographic process. I've kept the slides in German because it's always difficult to translate exactly. Um, and what uh, Caroline Müller Spitzer did as furthermore is she made the role of the different users of the end product of the end product more explicit. So we have got an end product for the human user and one for the computer. And she actually emphasized in that um, paper from 2003 that we should really only talk about dictionary when it's for the human user. And rereading this while working on this, uh, I thought, well, that actually does make sense to make that clear distinction. Then in 2015 or 16, 
um, there is the work that I did together with Annette Closer, and we included in our description some thoughts on how um, yeah, the lexicographic process for dictionary portals would look like. But that's not so relevant now, so I'll go quickly to um, our redefinition. So we feel that now the time has come to extend the definition again, because what we see is that more and more institutions are moving away from one, um, dic uh, one, data one database per dictionary to a single database from which several dictionaries can be uh, derived. So staying close to the original definition from Wiegand, we redefine it as uh, and then in between brackets, completed lexicographic process is the set of process activities performed to create a lexicographic database. Completed is in between brackets because we think that for a central or a generic database, it's never ever going to be completed. So that's... Um, and then if we... Um, yeah, we can build on the diagram proposed by Caroline Müller-Spitzer and don't pin us down on this. This is the first attempt to extend the diagram. And I think probably on, based on feedback that I hope to get from you here today, we will still make some changes to it. Anyway, it looks pretty daunting, I think. So I will zoom in on the part on the right hand side. And that's the part for the generic lexicographic database. And this is always in our opinion, a media-neutral lexicographic process so that can result in a product for a human user or for a technical use. And in the context of this conference, this part on the right-hand side is important and that actually corresponds to the theme of this conference, uh, the invisible lexicography. And I think here is the difference between, with the previous work for Wiegand and Caroline Müller-Spitzer, this was not part of lexicography and should not be studied in lexicography. We feel that it is part of the lexicographic process and that it should be studied in lexicography. And I think it's also that what um, makes, will make lexicography sustainable for the future. So we have got a process for a generic lexicographic database, but on the other hand, we still distinguish also a process for the one dictionary or lexical resource. I had some debates with this, with Annette, because I thought they could be put all together. We don't create one database for one project anymore, we reuse them. But Annette says, no, there are still quite a lot of projects which start off with a single dictionary in mind. Uh, so that's what we keep for the moment. But you see that here also, we have got the media neutral lexicographic process. Uh, and then, yes. So now you know more or less the background of what a lexicographic process is. So let's turn to the different phases of the lexicographic process. These were described in detail by Annette Closer in her 2013 uh, publication. And uh, the diagram on this slide, oh, the next one, okay, yeah, uh, gives you a little bit of an insight into the different tasks that go in each of these phases. And then during a cost ENL network, the European Net uh, Network for e lexicography, we had a separate meeting on the lexicographic process back in 2014, and we asked all the projects that were represented in uh, the European Network of e lexicography if they were willing to participate in a survey to see how well they could fit in their different uh, projects into these phases. And actually, we found that, and a uh, yeah more importantly, they suggested a seventh phase, the phase of maintenance and preservation, which we have integrated because these are important aspects of current day lexicography. And uh, yes, most projects managed to fit it into these phases. So um, these phases actually work pretty well for a single dictionary project. The question now is, can we still distinguish these same phases if we move towards a generic database? 
And before I try to answer that question, let's briefly look at the reasons for this change. Uh, oh no, but yeah. Right, so the first one, if we look at lexicography today compared to about 10 years ago, then we see clearly that there is a shift from print to online. For most of us, this has already, well, especially people attending the ELEX conferences, this is uh, common uh, knowledge. But our ELEXA surveys show that there are actually still some projects uh, producing print dictionaries, and if, but that uh, online dictionaries are now really the default. If a dictionary is uh, produced and printed, uh, then that's generally because it's part of a larger series and previous volumes have appeared in print, so they're still printed. Second, related to this, is the shift from unstructured to structured data. If you want your data to be presented online, you have to structure it because otherwise you can't search it. And well, unfortunately, we didn't really have the previous presentation, but the dictionary with code from the previous previous uh, presentation is also an example of this. Then there's the emergence of linguistic linked open data. And another important thing that we observed is the changing role of lexicography. Lexicography is becoming more and more of a data provider, so the invisible lexicography. And also crowdsourcing and gamification found their way into lexicography and posed challenges for the lexicographic process. And finally, uh, well, I can't ignore the technical innovations, of which there are many. So set against um, this background, we see that yeah, more and more institutions, at least, are moving towards this generic database approach. And an early adopter of this approach was already the Duden dictionaries back in 2002. Um, and yeah, the papers by Alexa and her colleagues are interesting read for those who are interested in it. And on this slide, we have just listed a few examples of um, adopters of this generic database approach. There are definitely, undoubtedly, more. So if you are also working on something similar, then me and Annette would love to hear about it so we can take it into account further revisiting the lexicographic process. Obviously, this new approach has got several uh, advantages and maybe disadvantages. Um, I think I can be fairly brief about the pros of this approach. Having a single pool of data has, um, is, it supports, of course, reusability of the data. And second, it supports efficient maintenance. So these are very important criteria. On the downside, or on the other side of the coin, there are also some challenges posed by this new approach. Um, many institutions who embark on it already have existing resources, and they need to integrate this heterogeneous content into one integrated database. This brings about the need for more stable and established formats for encoding the lexicographic data, and it raises the question on how to organize language data in a complex data model efficiently. And just to give you an idea of the complexity of such a model, this is the model of the Slovene uh, Digital Dictionary Database. It's completely unreadable. <laughs> but uh, yes, so this is the complexity that you face when you try to create such a generic database. And then related to that complexity, you want some tools that you can use to edit the content for the generic database. And that's also a challenge because it's different from what traditional dictionary writing systems are aimed to do. You work per head word, you write an entry, whereas if you are creating content for the generic database, you move more towards a task-based, a feature-based editing. So that's a different view on the data that is required. And I think in the presentation from uh, the Estonian Language Institute, you can learn more on that. And related to this, we see also that there's a, a change from the more hierarchical structuring of the data to a more relational organization. And in that context, there is the DMLEX presentation on Thursday that may be of interest. For lexicographers, it's not, um, well, and the way that lexicographers work will have to change as well, because lexicographers are not used to working, um, well, creating content for a generic database the task-based um, 
way of working. So that will be another challenge, and um, yeah, we'll have to see how that goes in practice. And if you have got your generic database, then you also have to think of how um, specific end products can be derived from this generic database. This may sound straightforward, but um, Chris Heil and, and Vincent van der Gisnster already pointed that out in the keynote at ELEX 2021, that this is not straightforward. And finally, how can you react, uh, extract the most accurate data from Corpora? And ideally, you like to have a more explicit link between your corpus data and lexicographic description, because that way you make your data more suitable also for training large language models. And all this requires a rethinking of the process. I already mentioned the keynote by my colleagues Chris and Vincent in 2001. So uh, the question is now, do we still think these phases that we talked about earlier are they still valid for a generic lexicographic database? We think they are valid. So you have got a phase of preparation, then a phase of acquiring corpus data, then you need to computerize, you need to create a corpus query system, a dictionary writing system. You will do automatic data extraction. Uh, there's a phase of data analysis and a phase of maintenance and preservation. And in addition to this, you have um, several phases that apply to individual end products and I think these ones here are specifically for a dictionary for human users that we have in mind. You have to have an ID, work the ID out, um, then you de uh, computerize. Well, you say, well, there's already content in my generic database, so why do I need the computerization? Well, you probably want to implement a specific interface for this end product. And then you need to prepare for publication and you have got your phase for maintenance and preservation. And then some of these phases in the creation for the generic database will have to become more task-based. And that's where we think is the, is the most challenging. To how do you define the tasks so that the lexicographer can do them and that they contribute to your generic database? Oh, yes. And then um, I would like to conclude with a brief discussion on how new technologies such as the AI-driven innovations and crowdsourcing and gamification can be included in the process. Well, in relation to AI, some of us may wonder whether lexicography, uh, well, is, uh, whether we will still have a lexicographic process or whether AI is going to take over completely. Uh, we will probably learn more about this in the round table tomorrow late afternoon. And just to spark off the discussion already a little bit, what does JetGPT about all this? Um, and I want to illustrate this with an answer that, uh, to a question that um, a colleague of my, uh, me posted to uh, JetGPT, asked whether JetGPT considers itself suitable for lexicography. Well, the answer is fairly um, politically correct, at least. So, and I think this is reassuring, it's useful or can be useful, but in conjunction with human expertise. So, lexicographers amongst us, we still <laughs> are needed. But if we do want to integrate AI into the process, uh, we foresee three potential roles. First, uh, we think that it can be useful for data acquisition, the creation of data. Second, for evaluating. And that's then sort of replacing maybe crowdsourcing and gamification. And finally, um, AI can be used as an, uh, another secondary source that lexicographers can use while doing the editing. And that has already been integrated, for instance, in TLEX. And then briefly, the crowdsourcing and gamification. Um, crowdsourcing and gamification are finding have found their way into lexicography, but uh, it's especially the Slovenes who have picked up on it really a lot and are doing a lot on it. Um, it still remains difficult. And I think the main difficulty is that it uh, co does cost a lot of time to do it properly, but if you do it, then it would fit in the data acquisition phase and in the phase of data analysis, but in the phase of preparation, time for do, including crowdsourcing needs to be uh, foreseen. So this, these are our thoughts on the changes in the lexicographic process. Uh, there's still many unanswered questions. 
Um, but I hope we have uh, set one step in the right direction again to better understanding the current lexicographic process. So thank you and I hope there's time for discussion. Thank you very much for this interesting talk that goes all the way back to Wiegand, uh, who is, if I may add, very complicated to understand even in German, not only the <laughs> translation to English, but German is already a toughie. So, what are your questions? Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, um, how, how does this gamification look like, or is it the gamification of the lexicological proce process or lexicographical process, or is it the uh, of, of the lexicographical databases? It is the gamification of the content, so content creation through playing games. And uh, there, we have an example of that, uh, I can already <laughs> announce it. If you go tomorrow to the demo session and go to the demo about CROWL, which is crowdsourcing for language learning, which is yeah, a, a gamification example of uh, trying to create data that can be useful for language learning, but also for lexicography. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah. Anybody else? That's at the back of the house. maybe a quick no note regarding gamification uh, we have gamification also in wikipedia and other other uh, say in facebook uh, say top commenter top reviewer and so on so these are you can uh, gain status as a user as a, uh, a um, contributor to to uh, this uh, database for lexicographical some some resource that's a gamification in that sense it's not gamification okay. uh, when you learning uh, through game it's uh, no, 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 two no. completely different things no yeah no that's why we <laughs> it's it's the, the game that i mentioned is to create data for language learning it's not language learning itself that is gamified that's what else mean? But yeah. Thank you for your presentation. It was very good. Um, I am a PhD student in corpus linguistics, and um, we tend to think there's no such thing as generic language. Are the generic dictionaries that we're talking about here more like multi purpose? Is like that they encompass many different use cases and registers or? Can you comment a little more about generic? Yes, well, it's, um, you either use the, germ, uh, the term uh, generic or central, I guess, and um, that was also one of our debates. <laughs> if you, you should see it more like a central database in which you store all the information that you have in the case for our language institute, the Dutch Language Institute, it would be all the information about the Dutch language. And then you try to put, yeah, all the information that you can share between different dictionaries, that's the core. And then there will be individual projects which will also be stored in this central database, which are not necessarily shared by other projects. That's, I, yeah. It's more that you want to re be able to reuse your data. And I see Chris, Chris wants to add something to this, but uh, yes, please, Chris. <laughs> no, I, I, I had actually a question, but now I have oh. to add something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. No, you don't have to add something. I can only add maybe that the generic versus um, was, comes from the uh, opposition generic specialized dictionary. Whereas, yeah. So, but these, yeah, it's, it's good. We need to get our terminology clear when we describe this process, but uh, thank you yeah, for your we, comment. For example, we also have a small dictionary that supports, that's supposed to support academic writing. They do have a dictionary because it explains terms in academic writing, but you don't need to include the etymology of, of, uh, of words. So that's how you have your central database that some are generic, but then you have specific um, applications. Okay. Now, can I now ask you? Yes, something? you can. <laughs> uh, in your definition, interestingly, you put the complete uh, between brackets. Um, does that link into the mod? So th I think that's an important question. If you go modular, if you have these different modules, they don't need to be, com all, not all of the information needs to be complete, which is quite different from 
um, a traditional article-based uh, dictionary process where you do have complete information about uh, every lemma that you have already uh, treated. So uh, is, is the incompleteness also um, a consequence of the modular um, uh, steps? It's not necessarily, I think, because you, even when we, well, go back five, eight years, then um, what was, we also talked about a modular approach, but the modular approach then meant selection of a certain set of items, lexical items that you would treat as a module. So you would first do all the entries for the animals, then you would move on to more abstract nouns or whatever. So that was also a modular way of editing. And there you could also have differences, like one entry could be in... Um, automatically uh, already appear online but then with automatically extracted data whereas another entry would be online but then post posted post edited by a lexicography so there you already had that incompleteness too i think in a way so and that was one of the things i forgot to stress these phases are not linear at all <laughs> it's and that's important to realize as well yeah thank you uh actually what you have just said is, is what I was going to, to comment. Is I think it's less and less of phases. It's things happening simultaneously. It's not like you've prepared your data and that's it. Now you've gone on to the next stage. These things, many of them continue continuously. I think that in these phases, it doesn't take so much the idea of what you mentioned is lexicographic resources being used for other things. I think there are things like data centers today where you can have a central uh, uh, repository, but also all kinds of extensions. And with linked data, uh, all of these things are working together. Yeah, thank yeah, you, Elon. Any more questions? Maybe one short more question, question if you like. Well, if not, I would have a just very short one. Linked data, um, do you have plans how to model as linked data? Are you going to write just simple scripts, XSLT, Python, something to turn A into B? Or are you working with some more sophisticated ecosystems like the wiki something, wiki semantic web family or systems like that? Oh, in the context of this presentation, we just note the emergence of the linguistic linked open data. And well, in the context of the work that we're doing at the Dutch Language Institute, we are looking into it. but. Um, I think our data will be made available as linked data, but yeah, it's not the first goal. We have got many other steps that we first need to take. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much again.